Good morning. How is everyone? It's a beautiful day today. Listen, we're currently going through the book of Acts. Um, however, I was at a conference, uh, speaking at a conference yesterday, and I felt impressed to share with you a message I brought to them. So if you would, turn to Romans chapter 13 this morning. Uh, we've been going through the book of Acts for over a year. We're, we're on the heels of finishing the book. Um, a couple more weeks, and uh, we should be done with the book of Acts. You know it's our practice here at Calvary Chapel to go through the Bible verse by verse, book by book. But today I feel like the Lord wants me to share this with you. And so Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 11 through 14, with the title of the message, Wake Up and Put on Christ. We need to wake up and put on Christ. Verse 11, Paul the Apostle writing to the church said, And do this, knowing the time, that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness let us put on the armor of light. <clears throat> Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Father, we pray as we study your word that your Holy Spirit would grip our hearts this morning with your word as we study it together in Jesus' name. Amen. As we embark upon a new year, one of the major questions that is on the mind oftentimes of God's people is, could this be the year? that Jesus comes back for his church? Will we be the generation that has the privilege of being raptured, taken forcefully from the earth to meet Jesus in the air and ever be with the Lord forever? Will we be the ones that witness that event? I have, to ask, I have to tell you that the answer to that question, I can say for sure, is this. We are closer to the return of Jesus than ever before. Would you agree with that? We, we are closer today to the return of Jesus Christ than ever before. In fact, as we look at our world, we look at world events, we see right now um, on the political scene, if you would, the, the nations that are coming to the forefront are setting the stage for the coming of Christ mentioned in the book of Revelation. We see Russia setting the stage. We see Iran in its place setting the stage. Turkey now turning from NATO and now align, uh, aligning themselves with Iran as well as with Russia. All predicted in the scriptures. We see the stage is being set and truly it's, it's closer now than it's ever been with Jesus's return for his church. Now the apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 after expounding to the Romans about the glorious salvation we have in Jesus, Paul now begins to shift gears and gives an exhortation in light of the coming of Jesus Christ, we need to put on Christ. In light of his soon return, we need to put Jesus on our daily life. This was a call to the Roman believers to action. Now note with me in verse 11, Paul says this, he says, and do this knowing the time. As we go through this section, I want, to, I want to break this down phrase by phrase. The first is found right there. And do this knowing the time. Now, what Paul is referring to here in this phrase, do this, is to the previous exhortations that he gave to the Romans in the previous chapters. In chapter 12, for example, in verse 1, Paul would say to present your body a living sacrifice. In addition... Paul also said in chapter 12, verse 6, make sure that you are using your spiritual gifts. In light of Christ's coming, walk with a life that is consecrated to Christ. In light of Christ's coming, use your spiritual gift. 
Later on in chapter 13, verse 1, Paul would say, be salt and light in obeying the laws of the land. And then down in chapter 13, verse 10, he said, love your neighbor. So Paul says this. He says, in light of Jesus' soon return, put that into practice. Use your spiritual gift. Make an investment for the kingdom of God. Find yourself a living sacrifice, the Bible tells us. Make sure you're being salt and light in the political world in which we live. Make sure your creed is brought to conduct. Your profession is brought into practice. This is what Paul says. Now, all of this is encapsulated with a phrase found in verse 14. He says there in verse 14, put on Christ. Put on Christ. This Paul is essentially saying. Now, again, as you read through the New Testament, I think it's so important to note that that phrase is repeatedly used throughout the letters, throughout the epistles. Putting on. Oftentimes, Paul will say, put on, put off the old life. And then he will say, put on the new life. In fact, he told the Colossians in chapter 3, verse 14, he said, above all, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. In addition, he said to the Ephesians in chapter 4, in verse 24, put on the new man, which was created according to God and true righteousness and holiness. And so this, this phrase, this idea of putting on is so important to the Christian life. Paul uses it repeatedly through the letters in which he wrote. Now the question is, what does it mean? What, what does that mean to put on Christ? Here's a simple definition. Putting on Christ is appropriating all the spiritual resource we have in Jesus. Putting on Christ is appropriating all the spiritual resource we have in Jesus. One man that I love to quote, his name is uh, Warren Wiersbe. He says it the best. He said, putting on Christ is taking off the grave clothes and it's putting on the grace clothes. That's what it is. It, it's discarding the old life and, and, and putting on the new life. I got saved in 1992. And on the day that I got saved, I was, I was set free from sin. I was brought into newness of life. And one thing that the Lord began to reveal to me in the scriptures, as I'm sure with many of you, is when a person is born again, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit comes to live within their life. We're sealed, the Bible says, with the Holy Spirit. And God begins to change us from the inside out. The, the old life is discarded and a new life is now being appropriated. All the things that I used to do that I was, the Bible says, in Adam, my, my sinful conduct, my old way of thinking, my old way of life has been discarded. And now I'm to walk in newness of life. This is what Paul says here when he says, put on the, the, the new man, put on Christ. Now, a couple of things to note regarding this. One is it's, in a, it's, a, it's an imperative mood, which simply means it's a command. Did you know that when the Bible tells us that we're to put on, it's, it's actually a command? It's not a suggestion. You know, sometimes we can think that, you know, I'll, I'll put it on when I think it's, you know, good. No, the Bible actually says we need to put on Christ on a consistent basis. And also, it's in the eritist tense, which simply means we're to do it now. We're to do it right now. I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I'm guilty of putting things off, aren't you? I know some of you are. Don't lie, you're in church. You put things off. I know you do. I'm the same way. You know, there was years ago there was a there was a something that we started to know as notice in one of my my girl's room and um, started to notice that there was always this this moisture on the carpet and we were like, what what is that? You know, and and I just kind of put it off and didn't pay attention to it and and sure enough, you know, after I left it alone for over a period of time, I started to notice the the wall starting to bubble a little bit and. And so, you know, I was like, well, maybe I need to paint it. You know, I just painted it a little bit. And, and, and it wouldn't go away. It wouldn't go away. And, and finally, what I realized was, you know what? There's something wrong behind the wall. So I opened the wall up, cut the sheetrock out, and sure enough, there was a pipe that had a little pinhole hole in it. And I, I identified the problem. We fixed the problem. Then I tried to close that hole up, which didn't work really well. And... Uh, and then we, we, we finished it off. We finished it off. You know, sometimes, sometimes as Christians, we can be that way. We put things off. There's problems going on in our heart. 
there, there's a leak, if you would, going on in your life. Things that are coming out aren't that aren't aren't doing so well, and we have a tendency of putting it off. But the Bible tells us until we open the hole and get to the root of the problem, it's going to constantly be there. We have to get to the root of the issue. And the Apostle Paul tells us here in this text, we must be a people that gets to the root of the issue, and that's put off the old man, put on the new man, because Jesus Christ is coming soon. John Wesley said it best. He said, putting on Christ contains the whole of our salvation. It's the strong and beautiful expression for the most intimate union with him, being clothed with all the graces which were in him. The apostle does not say, put on purity and sobriety, peacefulness and benevolence, but he says all this and a thousand times more at once in saying, put on Christ. Put them on. Now, the question then is, why is this so important? Two reasons in this text. Two reasons why we need to put on Christ. Number one, time is short. Would you agree with that? Time is short. Number two, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Jesus is coming soon. We, we need to appropriate who we are in Jesus. Number one, as it says on the screen, time is short. Time is short. Paul says there in verse 11, and do this knowing the what? What does it say there in your Bible? Knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Time is short, Paul says. Now, if it was short in Paul's day, we're talking short right now. It's really short. In fact, interesting word to note, the word there in verse 11 for time. There are two words actually used in the New Testament for time. One is the word chronos, and it literally speaks of the calendar time. It speaks of chronological time, and it speaks of the clock time. That's what it's used for in the New Testament. There's another word that's used, and that's the word karios, and that speaks of a strategic time. It speaks of an opportune time, and that's the word that Paul uses here. What Paul is saying is we need to appropriate Christ because we have a strategic time of opportunity to make our life count and make a difference for the kingdom of God. Do, do you guys realize that when we are raptured or when we go to heaven and be with the Lord, there is no way you are going to evangelize in heaven? Do, you, do we understand that here this morning? Everybody's saved in heaven. So we have, a, we have one shot at it right now, right now to make our life count and to take advantage of the opportunities that God's bringing your way. Let me ask you a question. Are you taking advantage of those opportunities in your life? At the gas station, at the mall, in Forever 31? No, it's Forever 21. <laughs> or are you taking advantage of the opportunity at your job, with your family, with your neighbor? It's so important, Paul says, make your life count now because Jesus is coming soon. Paul would say to the Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Man, I love what James says in his epistle. He says that, you know, life is a vapor. We're here, and we're gone. We're here, and then we're gone. Someone has rightly said that our life is like the dash on a tombstone. The year you were born... The year that you die is on the tombstone, and in the middle is a, a dash. My question is, what are you doing with your dash? What are you doing? Are you using it for God's glory? This is what Paul is inferring here when he says, put on Christ because time is short. Number two, verse 11, he says there, put on Christ because our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. I love this, I love this phrase that he uses. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believe believe. Now, again, not to get too technical, but I do think it's important if you're going to be a Bible student, you will read this word salvation throughout the epistles of Paul, the epistles of Peter. You'll read it also in the epistles of John. And salvation, according to the New Testament, has three tenses to it. Three. It has a past tense, a present tense, and a future tense. Salvation does. In the past tense, salvation refers to justification. The moment you believe, the Bible says you are justified. 
And justification simply means just as if you've never sinned. Isn't that a glorious truth? God sees me, God sees you right now in Christ just as if you've never sinned. That's an amazing truth. That's one aspect of salvation, the past tense of salvation. Then there's the present tense, which is related to sanctification. Sanctification means right now, God by the Holy Spirit is conforming me and changing me into the image of Jesus Christ. That he's committed to make me look like Jesus and make you look like Jesus. It's a work that God does on the inside out. God sanctifying me. I think Alan Redpath said it best. He said, justification is the miracle of a moment. Sanctification is the process of a lifetime. And I don't know about you, but I'm like, Lord, you got a lot of work to do in my life. Make me more like Jesus. Each and every day when I wake up, make me more like Jesus. Help me to see like Jesus sees. Help me to talk like Jesus talked. Help me to live like Jesus lived by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a tense. That's the present tense of salvation. Then you have the future tense of salvation, and that speaks and is directly related to glorification. The past tense, justification. The present tense, sanctification. Future tense, glorification. That's the tense that Paul uses right here in this text. That our salvation, our glorification is drawing nearer than when we first believed. Now, if you're not excited about getting a new body, I don't know what's going to get you excited. Because uh, quite honestly, all of us, uh, I think, struggle from time to time with health. And, you know, the older you get, the more you realize, man, I, uh, I can't wait for my glorified body. I'm going to see Jesus face to face. I'm going to get a glorified body. And I, I, I'm longing for that day. Paul says here, make sure you're putting on Christ because your salvation is drawing nearer than when you first believed. Your glorification is coming, man. When, we, when Jesus comes back for the church, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us he will descend with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up, taken forcefully. If you have a Latin translation, the word is raptoro, raptured from the earth to meet the Lord in the air, and we're going to go back to heaven for a seven-year wedding feast. And I can't wait to taste what heaven's food is like. You know? Will they have deer there? Some venison wrapped in bacon? That's really good, by the way. If you've never tried, if you've never tried deer wrapped in bacon, it's, it's off the charts phenomenal. It really is. Especially if you live here in, in Dover and, and plants. I mean, it's like really good. What's, what, what's that going to be like? Having... Having enjoyed a seven-year wedding feast with the Lord, that's something to look forward to. That's something to look forward to. Some of you that have loved ones that have moved on. Some of you that have perhaps mother or father that's gone home to be with the Lord. Maybe some of you have a child that's gone home prematurely to go be with the Lord. Don't you long for the day when we're going to see them face to face? Our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. And so Paul says here, put on Christ because the time is short and Jesus is coming, is drawing near. Now this phrase, this idea of Jesus is coming, drawing near, it's called eminence. It's a, it's a doctrinal statement that's used by commentators and scholars. It speaks, that, it speaks of Jesus coming at any moment. The Bible teaches that Jesus can come for his church at any moment moment in life he can come in five minutes we'll finish this bible study in heaven jesus will finish it for us but the bible tells us that he'll he'll he's coming at any moment and i i think that's such an important point because sometimes people get confused with the difference between the second coming of christ and the rapture of the church there is a difference by the way there is a difference between the second coming of jesus christ and the rapture of the church. Let me let me give you an explanation on this. First of all, the rapture of the church is Jesus will come for his saints and meet us in the air. Then you'll have 7 years of tribulation upon the earth. At the end of that 7 year period of tribulation, Jesus then will come with the church. Rapture, he comes for the church. The Bible tells us at his second coming, he comes with the church. Riding white horses, may I add. So if you don't know how to ride a horse, get you get ready. 
Because that, that day's coming. The Bible tells us Jesus will come for us, and then he will bring his people with him at the, at the end of the tribulation period. At the rapture, Jesus meets his church in the air, and at the second coming, Jesus establishes his kingdom on the earth. At the rapture, Jesus comes for the church to deliver us from judgment, to keep us from judgment. At the second coming, the Bible tells us he comes to bring judgment. He comes as king of kings and lords of, a lord of lords. Revelation chapter 19 tells us he comes with a sword coming out of his mouth. And, and uh, man, he levels an army there in the valley of Megiddo. At the rapture, Jesus comes as a thief in the night. And Revelation chapter 1 tells us at the second coming, every eye will see him. So there is a distinct difference. And Paul is encouraging us as believers to live in light of the eminence, that he, he can come back at any moment in time. R.A. Torrey, he said that the eminent return of our Lord is the great Bible argument for a pure, unselfish, devoted, unworldly, active life of service. So let me ask you this. Are you ready? Are you re If Jesus were to come today, would you say, I am ready? I'm absolutely ready. I can't wait for that moment. Or would you say, you know, I'm not ready? Something to consider. J.C. Ryle, he said that the uncertainty about the date of the Lord's return is calculated to believers in an attitude of constant expectation and to preserve them from despondency. And that's such a good word, you know. The, the, the coming of Christ should always keep us in a place of preserving us from despondency and living a pure life. 1 John chapter 3, it says in verse 3, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So I ask you, are you ready? Now, here's a question that I want us to consider for a moment. How close are we? How close are we until Jesus comes again for the church? And again, the best answer to that question is we are closer today than we were yesterday. We're close. But Jesus does tell us in Matthew's gospel in chapter 24, verse 8, that there would be signs that would be associated with the coming of Christ. Jesus actually said that they would be, uh, there, there would be, he called it the beginning of sorrows. Uh, another translation is the beginning of birth pains. Now, I've, I've been married for 23 years. We have four kids, one in college, two in high school, one in middle school. And I can remember with our first child, some of you that have kids in this room know what that's like. Your first, always a crazy, crazy time. And uh, my wife, Lucia, who's not here, so I can tell you this, uh, she was in labor for 29 hours. That's a whole, we went, we went through three doctors, uh, three sets of nurses. I mean, it was, it was a long time. And uh, we, we knew that moment had come because the, the birth pains called contractions started to increase in frequency as well as with intensity. And Jesus actually uses that very example to be a sign of his soon return, growing in frequency as well as with intensity. And do we not see signs around us growing in frequency as well as with intensity? Listen, folks, we see right now signs that will be seen getting close to the second coming of Christ. And if we see a stage being set for the second coming of Christ signs, how much closer is the rapture of the church? Someone has rightly said, and I love this, if we see Christmas decorations going up in October, you know Thanksgiving's right around the corner. If you start seeing second coming signs on the horizon, that means the rapture of the church is that much closer. And I want to give to you several to consider. Several signs of knowing that we're getting close. Number one, here's the first sign. Israel's back in their land. Why is that so significant, you ask? Well, you need to understand the first super sign, and scholars call this one a super sign, is Israel's actually back in their land. When you go back in history and you begin to study history, world events, Bible prophecy, 
One thing you're going to find is that in 70 AD, Titus Vespasian and the Roman army ransacked the city of Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed. Thus, there is no temple today in Israel. They, they destroyed it. And as a result, the Jews were scattered across the world. From 70 AD to 1948, Israel ceased to exist as a nation. They scattered throughout the earth. So that bears a question. How are all the Old Testament prophecies going to be literally fulfilled if Israel ceased to exist from 70 AD to 1948? Well, the answer is this. They became a nation in 1948. And in 1948, when they became a nation, we find that they are now setting the stage to see Old Testament and New Testament prophecies being fulfilled with them as a nation. I'll give you uh, several verses to keep in mind. The first is found in Ezekiel chapter um, 38. The Bible says, In the last days, Russia will come and make war with the nation of Israel, also called the Battle of Gog and Magog. Israel, however, needed to be in the land for that prophecy to be fulfilled. Here's another. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 9, in the tribulation period, the Antichrist will actually make a covenant with the nation of Israel for seven years, a seven-year covenant. But that presupposes Israel needed to be in the land in order for the Antichrist to make a covenant with the nation of Israel. You follow? So we see that them being in the land itself is actually setting the stage and seeing the word of God completely fulfilled. John Wolverd said it best. He said, he said, of the many phenomena which characterize the present generation, few events can claim equal significance as far as Bible prophecy is concerned with that of the return of Israel to their land. It constitutes a preparation for the end of the age, the setting for the coming of the Lord, and the fulfillment of Israel's prophetic destiny. End quote. Are you ready? Israel's in the land, folks. You see them in the news all the time. It's a super sign that we are getting close. In addition, I would also say number two is religious deception. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 5, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Religious deception, Jesus said, will increase in frequency as well as with intensity. And you know, as we look at our world, do we not see deception all around us? Deception all around us. And unfortunately, some of that deception is getting into the church. We must be Bereans in these last days, finding ourselves taking everything that we're listening to and comparing it to the Word of God, making sure that we are aligning it with Scripture and seeing if this is in fact true. Religious deception. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 Paul the Apostle said that the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Can I encourage you? When you hear the podcast, when you read the blog, when you're being exposed to other kinds of teachings, make sure that you're comparing it to what the Bible says. Be a Berean. Be a person that knows God's Word. Otherwise, you're likely to be deceived. Make sure that you are being a student of God's word. Number three, international distress. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, you will hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Interesting. Turn on the TV. Do we see international distress growing in frequency as well as with intensity? Of course we do. We see it all the time. Time Magazine took a poll that 51% of Americans believe that a man-made disaster will wipe out civilization during the next century. You read of the recent headlines and what we're going to do with North Korea if they get nuclear capability. All of these things right now are being brought to the forefront and remind us that the coming of the Lord is near. Here's another food for thought. What about Syria? You ever consider why people are making such a big deal about Syria? Sy Syria? I didn't say cereal. I said Syria. It's on the front page news on a consistent basis. It's been that way for about a year or more. 
always hearing about Syria. I, I bring that to your attention because the Bible tells us that Syria will actually come to the, to the world stage in the last days. In the last days. In fact, Isaiah chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, the Bible says that Damascus, which was the capital of Syria, will become a heap of ruins, utterly destroyed, and some wonder in that prophecy, is that because a warhead hits the city? We don't know. But it, but it does bring up the interesting observation that in the last days, Syria will take a huge step forward in being on the world stage. And do we not see that today? That prophecy will be fulfilled, by the way, of Damascus becoming a heap of ruins. Number four, number four, resistance to the faith will increase. Matthew 24, verse 9, Jesus said, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my namesake. Then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. As we get closer, the Bible tells us, to the time of Jesus, there will be a growing opposition to the faith. A growing opposition to the faith. And we see this in our universities. We see this in our schools. We see this right now trying to be legislated into law. A growing opposition to the faith. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, when we look at our world and our culture and we start seeing people really wanting to uh, mandate laws and bring into law that, that pastors can't speak against uh, homosexuality being a sin, which Romans 1 is very clear that that's a sin, and that's not right, and that's totally not from God. When you start preaching on that and you start making, making a point that that's not right, that's wrong, that's sin, they call that a hate crime. Interesting. There's Opposition is starting to grow in frequency as well as with intensity. Again, another sign that we're moving towards the closer we get to the time of Jesus Christ. Number five, moral decay will increase. Again, Matthew 24, verse 12, Jesus said, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. It'll grow cold. Paul said in, Rome, um, in 2 Timothy, pardon me, chapter 3, verse 1, know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Fierce times, fierce times, violent times will increase. You remember when Columbine took place? A distant thought, isn't it? It shocked our nation. It shocked our nation. We, we, we had yet to see anything like that. The testimony of Cassie Bernal really rocked the world. People willing to die for their faith. But now, as we get closer to the time of Christ, Columbine is being repeated over and over in different parts of the states. Over and over, we're seeing this growing rapidly. Again, sign of the time. Moral decay will increase, the Bible tells us. Number six, a cashless society. The Bible says in the last days there will be a push toward a cashless society. Revelation chapter 13 tells us that in the tribulation period, when the Antichrist emerges as a world leader, he will mandate a mark on the forehead and on the hand. And no one can buy or sell unless they get the mark of the beast. The world will push towards a cashless society. No one will be able to make a transaction without getting that mark. Interesting to note, in the secular world today, there is a push to go cashless, to move to a cashless society. I found this article interesting in Forbes. Ran an article with a practical appeal for the RFID implant chip. In theory, it's quick authentication that's faster, cheaper, more reliable than any other biometrics like thumbprints or facial scans. The fact that a secular magazine is pushing for a cashless society is interesting to me. It's interesting to me. It's eye-opening to see. Number seven, knowledge will increase. Knowledge will increase. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, it says that in the last days, many will run to and fro, and knowledge will shall increase. Man, we've seen the explosion of knowledge 
within the last 10 years. Within the last 10 years, Mark Hitchcock in his book, 101 Answers to the End Time Events, he said this, consider these figures on the growth of knowledge in our world. From 1900 to 1950, 50 years, knowledge doubled. From 1950 to 1960, in 10 years, knowledge doubled. From 1960 to 1968, in eight years, knowledge doubled. From 68 to 1990, every three years, knowledge doubled. 1990 to 2013, every year, knowledge is doubling, and it's growing exponentially. It's growing exponentially. I, I believe right now that what we are witnessing is a scaffolding being set. The stage is being set. And if we see signs that will be seen in the second coming of Christ, the rapture of the church is that much closer. It's that much closer. So how should we respond? Back to the text. Look what this says. Romans 13, it tells us three things. Number one, anticipation. Number two, motivation. And number three, consecration. This information should affect us in three ways. And he tells us how it should affect us right here in verse 11. First is anticipation. He says, and do this knowing the time that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. Awake out of sleep. This was a metaphor used to describe the condition of apathy and lethargy in the church. Again, Paul is speaking to believers. He said, it's time to wake up. It's time to realize the days in which we're living, waking up from an apathetic condition. Now, Jesus tells us in Luke's gospel, I love this verse, chapter 12, verse 35, that in these last days we should be those that have our waist girded and our lamps burning. In, in biblical times, when a waist was girded, they would wear these long robes, and when they would go out to work in the field, they would pull up their, their robe right up to the knee area, and they would tuck the, the access underneath their belt. They would tie it down. It was a sign of mobility and readiness. That's the idea of being ready, man. I'm, I'm anticipating Jesus is coming. I want my waist girded with truth. In addition, he said, lamps burning. And again, when you go back to the Old Testament, you'll find that lamps only burned well when it was filled with oil. And oil is always pointing to the person and work of the Spirit of God. Oil always represents the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Our lamp filled with oil, the Spirit of God, so that we might be light to a lost and dying world. Paul would say in Ephesians chapter four or chapter 5, verse 14, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Are you watching? Are your eyes open? Are you awake to what's going on around you? Anticipation. Number two, he says motivation in verse 12. Paul says there should be motivation. He says the day is at hand. The day is at hand. The, the idea of putting on Christ because we have a window of opportunity to make our lives count. There's motivation. Now the Bible tells us that when we meet Jesus one day in the air, he's going to take us back to heaven and we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to be rewarded with what you did here on earth how you lived your life here on earth, what you did with the resource God gave you, you will actually be rewarded for those things. There's going to be crowns given in heaven. I, want a, I don't want a Burger King crown. I want a real crown so I can cast down at the feet of Jesus. But there should be a, a motivating factor here that, man, yes, time is short. Jesus is coming. I need to make my life count. And I, I need to be motivated in serving the Lord. Jesus said... Work while it is still day. The night is coming when no one can work. In John's gospel, the fourth chapter, he says, Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Are you motivated? Are you involved? Are you active in your faith? Such an important point. And then thirdly, not only anticipation, not only motivation, but notice Thirdly, verse 12 is consecration. This is the final point here. Watch what he says here. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us cast off the works of darkness. Some of you are in this room right now, and there's, there's things going on right now, and you know, man, I shouldn't be involved in this. 
You need to cast off the works of darkness. Remove it. Get rid of it. And then he says, put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, not as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Then he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Consecration. Consecration is how our life should be lived in these last days. I'm anticipating, I'm motivated to serve, and I'm consecrating my life. Lord, here are my eyes, here are my ears, here's my hands, here's my feet. My life is absolutely given over to serve you and to do your will. Is that you? Does that describe your life? Now, this, this idea of consecration is actually seen in one word right here in verse 13. Don't miss it. He uses the word walk. He says, let us walk properly. That word is actually used through the New Testament. Paul would say, walk circumspectly, carefully, not as unwise, but redeem the time. Paul would say in Ephesians 5, walk in love. The Apostle John would say in 1 John chapter 1, walk in the light as he is in the light. The, the idea of walking, it speaks of a lifestyle. This should be our everyday practice of how we live our life as believers. And walking also speaks of forward motion. Is there forward motion in our life? That's what Paul is referencing here. And uh, man, what a, what a good word to ask ourselves. Is there, is there things right now that are impeding progress? Get rid of it so that there can be an anticipation, a motivation, and a consecration. It may be that there's just a few in this room where God was putting some things right now, his finger on your heart, and, and there are areas where you're like, yeah, you know what, that, that, that shouldn't be there anymore. I, I need to get rid of that. I got great news for you. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, he can cleanse you from that, he can wash you from that, and can make you brand new in that area. And others of you that would say, you know what, I'm, I just need, once again, my spiritual antennas up to realize, yeah, I'm living in the last days, and I, I want to make my life count. There's grace for you, power from the Holy Spirit to give you what you need to make a difference. These are three specific areas that I believe the Lord wants us to ask ourselves. Does this reflect us? And he wants it to. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, for the grace that we need right now to consider your, your coming is soon, Lord. To consider that the signs are upon us, Lord. And I pray, God, for each of us in this room that we would be living a life that is set apart for you. Maybe you're here this morning. You would say, you know what? I, yeah, there's some things I, I, would, I need to get right. And I, I want to do that right now. Can I encourage you? Just confess that to the Lord. The Bible says, if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe others would say, you know what? I don't, I don't know the Lord. I, I've never, I don't know what it is to be forgiven of my sin. I've never asked Jesus to be my savior. I want to invite you right now to accept Christ into your life. The Bible says that we've sinned and our sin has separated us from God. But God so loved you, God so loved me, that he sent his son to pay the penalty for your sin and mine. And his son died on a cross for your sin and mine. And he rose from the dead and he stands at the door of your heart right now and he's knocking. If you just open the door, he'll come in. Forgive you and make you a brand new person. And you can ask Jesus to do that right now through this prayer. Just repeat this, meaning it from your heart. And, and the Bible tells us that you will be forgiven and made a brand new person. Just say something like this. Lord Jesus, I confess my sins to you today. And I turn from those things and I turn to you. I believe you took my place on that cross. You paid the penalty for my sin. And I believe rose from the dead. And I ask now that you come and be my Lord and be my Savior. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me?